you guys could turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 9. We'll read the text for tonight, and then Eric will come up and share the first portion of our study tonight. Acts chapter 9. I'll give you a second to turn there. If you don't have a Bible, we do have one over here at the table, several over here at the table, and we also will have the words on the screen if you want to follow there. Follow along with me. Acts chapter 9 verse 1 says, But Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Verse 7, The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise, go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And there he has authority from, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, and the Lord, or excuse me, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. This is the word of the Lord. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Let's pray. God, <clears throat> thank you so much for gathering us together today, and Lord, we just ask that the message that is preached today would um, be taken directly to the heart, Lord, that um, you would use the scriptures to create action in our lives that we might fulfill our purpose and mission given to us. Lord, thank you for speaking to us. And um, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, a um, little backstory. The uh, past few weeks have, uh, man, challenging, challenging for me. Christ is written all through these scriptures, and there's just so much that I personally could have chosen to, to write about, but uh, through prayer, and I know through your prayer, um, I sought God and asked him to reveal to me um, what to share today. So um, I, uh, I actually shared with my wife many times, <laughs> and uh, every time was totally different. So uh, forgive me if I'm ref referencing my notes often, uh, as even my notes are different from earlier this morning. <laughs> <laughs> God is good. Um, and uh, we see uh, in the scripture God's glory and his grace uh, all through the scripture. Um, so let's start with Saul. Who was Saul? Um, Saul was a Jew uh, who was very proud of his heritage. He was uh, a Roman citizen, um, uh, which gave him a special status, uh, especially in, in uh, Jerusalem. Um, he was uh, not only privileged by that, but also proud to be a Roman citizen. He was a scholar, uh, 
uh, is proud of his intelligence, um, much like we're proud of our own knowledge that we hold dear and even use to prop ourselves up sometimes. Um, and he claimed he's a Pharisee, uh, holding himself to the law and holding others to it. Um, the Pharisees were known to be hypocrites, and how often do we find ourselves being in those situations sometimes? <clears throat> so um, I think we can all find a way to relate to Saul in this text, and um, brings me to the first point that God led me to bring to you, is God's saving grace flows to those whom he is drawing to himself. So <clears throat> we start off with Saul set out to destroy the church in Damascus, which was some 135 miles from where he got his arrest warrants. Um, <clears throat> so we assume, or at least I am assuming, that Saul probably had the city in his sights at this time when flashes of light came and the glory of Jesus was in front of him. Um, in fact, that was such a, uh, um, that was God's grace. That was God's grace for Jesus to even appear to him. He didn't have to do it that way, but he chose to. He chose to lay his grace upon him, and through that, a revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the risen Christ. <clears throat> um, so uh, Jesus reveals himself by name as uh, we see Saul ask, us, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. <clears throat> so uh, how is God's saving grace, uh, saving grace affecting Saul? Well, in this moment, uh, he's down on the ground. Um, I, I would have, if it was me, I'd be laying face down on the ground. <laughs> uh, I probably wouldn't see too much, but um, <clears throat> he's being humbled. I mean, you, th you see that uh, he's being humbled by God's saving grace to see his own pride and his own self-righteousness. Um, we see that the same work is actually done for us um, before we can actually, uh, we, have to, we have to bring ourselves humbly to the Lord. Um, and that's all done by God's saving grace. Saul is not destroyed. He is not damned at that point. He is not dead. God lets him live. This is the man leading the rebellion against the new church, the church of Christ, that he doesn't kill him. That's a lot of grace. Saul receives an encounter like no other, one that is inspirational, one that is wowing, <clears throat> all by God's saving grace. And if you have met Christ in this sort of encounter, um, it probably didn't happen to you that way, but Christ does meet us before we are saved. He reveals himself to us by saving grace. <clears throat> so at this point, all of this has happened a very short amount of time. Um, God's grace just pouring over Saul while he's down on the ground and Christ gives him a command. <clears throat> tells him to rise, tells him to enter the city where he was to go anyway, and to wait, and that he will be told what to do. So he is led by the hand because he can't see. No longer puffed up by the full, um, or full, I'm sorry, no longer puffed up, but full of the knowledge that Jesus is the Christ, that he has been opposing the very God that he cherishes. Man, that's, that's got to be hard. <clears throat> Realizing that all this work and energy that you've been putting into, feeling self-righteous, or realizing you were self-righteous, but feeling like you are on the right path, and then 
a revelation of you being on the other side. Um, it's kind of like the disappointment a child has when they're playing soccer and uh, they kick the goal, kick the ball in the wrong goal, uh, scoring a point for the other team. Um, man. So um, he, he has seen all the authority that he's had is now lost. Uh, it's all lost to him. His own self-understanding and man's knowledge, it means nothing. So he gets to the city, and what's he do? What would you do if God sent you and said, go and wait, you'll be told, you'll be told what to do? Well, Saul knows what to do. He fasts. He fasts and he prays. And I'm sure you can imagine some of the prayers that Saul was was praying to God. I'm sure he was asking for forgiveness. I'm sure that um, through the revelation of Jesus being the Christ, um, man, I probably, if I thought about it, I could probably speak about it all night. Um, So, if I can find where I was. Um, God doesn't stop there. He's, he's praying, he's fasting, and what do we see? Well, in the text, we actually see God still giving more of his saving grace to Saul. <clears throat> he knows he's going to hear from God. He's, his, God's saving grace is giving Saul vision. He's giving him a vision of a messenger that's going to come. Um, And that messenger is Ananias. He sees Ananias coming to him and laying his hands on him and restoring his vision. Now, he doesn't go into great detail about um, the... um, you know, what, what else God had actually said to him in, in this story. We actually get to see some of that later in, um, in, in Paul's writings. But uh, Ananias is actually told that Saul is a chosen instrument of God. And can I point out that this is all before Saul has been saved? That's pretty amazing. That is full of grace right there. Uh, Saul actually, uh, in his own words uh, from Romans 8.29, says, uh, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So maybe more plainly, that God has chosen those before, way before, for the earth. God has chosen those who he's drawing to himself. He chose Saul to be this instrument, knew everything that Saul was going to do, even the, you know, those horrible things. But he needed Saul to become who he was in order to reveal to him his plan and use him as the instrument to start his church. It's amazing. Which brings me to the second point that um, I'm going to share with you guys. And that is every conversion is miraculous. So um, I have said I'm about 300 times. We can all look at Saul's conversion, and we all see that it's full of God's glory, it's full of God's grace, um, and how God is glorified through the drastic transformation of this man. Um, Everyone has a story, and some of those stories are great, some of them are inspiring, um, and, and some of them aren't. Some of them seem plain Jane. One of the things that God brought me through uh, this study was actually looking at my own 
uh, story of finding Christ. And that's how I saw mine. I saw my story as um, one that was no frills, just a run-of-the-mill uh, you know, revelation, acceptance, conversion. Um, but it's actually awesome because I can't do that myself. I could never save myself. <clears throat> so I can remember, uh, I can actually remember the, the very moment that, um, that I chose Christ. And uh, I'd like to share a quote from C.S. Lewis, because uh, I think he says it very well in the exact way I was feeling. He says, I say, chose, yet it did not really seem possible to do the opposite. So when God is holding your heart and the union of your eternal spirit is united with your soul and your body, that is miraculous. That is amazing. It can only be done by God. Saul's story is very awe-filled. It's glorious. Um, but I want you to not so be inspired by the man's story. I want you to look and be awe-filled at the grace and the miraculous works of God. We all need Christ to be brought to the Father. I mean, it's, it's grace through faith that saves us. Joel said that earlier. What better way to draw yourself now to the Father is through his scriptures and seeking him. We should not rely on the things of this world. We should rely on our own knowledge that builds, uh, not to rely on our own knowledge that builds pride in us, we need to surrender to the calling of Christ. To trust in the saving grace of the Father and be awe filled with every movement of God. Pastor Joel, if you would like to come finish this message. So for those that showed up late and you didn't catch what I had shared about Eric, that, that was Eric's first time preaching the word, and I'm so proud of what God is doing in his life, and I was, God's speaking to me already, is this not amazing, just the miraculous work of, even as he said, I don't feel like I need to add to what he said, I feel like he said what needed to be said about conversion, about um, Saul's life, about grace, and so we're going to just pick it up right from there, and he already mentioned that he, he was going to meet this man, Ananias, and it's incredible, and we're going to hear a few, just a few points. We're not going to go a whole lot longer. Um, but just to kind of conclude this is that God had been preparing, also as he's been preparing Saul, he's been preparing a, another disciple in Damascus that is going to be instrumental in bringing Saul to faith in Christ, which is amazing that how God does that. He did something similar with, with uh, the disciples uh, in Samaria as well as, as uh, Simon was there, and he was this sorcerer, and Philip was there preaching the gospel. Well, it says that there were disciples there that gave their life to Christ, or that were there that had, they had a knowledge of God, and yet he waited for John and Peter to come from Jerusalem before they could lay their hands on them, and then through that witness of other believers, then the Holy Spirit came upon them, and, and they were... Uh, I believe there at that moment, filled with the Spirit and converted to Christ. Well, there's a, there's a, a man named Ananias who's being prepared in Damascus waiting for Saul. And when the Lord came to Ananias in a vision, <clears throat> the first thing I want you guys to notice is that he simply said, here I am. And now it's been a while since we read the text, but that's something that we need to take note of. Eventually, Saul's going to be that kind of a guy, a here I am kind of a guy. Notice that when he first met him on the road, Saul had nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Christ, really. And it was through revelation that Saul will become this apostle for the Gentiles. But Ananias replied, he said, here I am, Lord, when he came to him in a vision. It's worth noting this because to come to the Lord with here I am before you fully know his will 
is a state of humility. And I think it's worth us noting that about Ananias, how he came and with his fear about who Saul was and not knowing fully what God was going to do as he encountered this murderer, he said, here I am. Just to think, think of the gravity of a situation to submit to the will of God before you know the will of God. To submit to him in a way of saying, here I am, Lord, whatever you say, I'll do it. And there's many of us, I think, that would be challenged by that because we're, we, we, we demand far too much of God and, and rather than coming humbly and just saying, here I am. We, I believe that there are far too many Christians, and maybe you are one or you know of some, Christians demanding things of God. Like, I won't do this and God better do this if I'm going to follow him. And I don't want to follow a God that does this. I want to follow a God that does that. When all what we, we, have, we have in the scripture, this perfect and complete revelation of who God is. And look at this witness of Ananias. And he says, here I am, Lord. I want to be that, right? I would challenge you that if you're not that, if that's not you tonight, where you've, you're at a place where if the Lord, no matter what he told you to do or whatever direction to go tonight, that you would be in that place that by his Holy Spirit, you would say, even now, not knowing tomorrow, here I am, Lord, right? Whatever you want. Here I am is similar to saying and confessing. Confessions are good, by the way. Confess these kinds of things. I am the clay. You are the potter. What does that mean, right? If you really confess that you're just like a lump of clay and you believe that the scriptures, what they say is that he is the potter, then you're basically saying, I'm yours to mold. I'm I'm here. I'm nothing but this lump of clay that, that you see beauty in and you're going to shape me. So here I am, Lord. He's the master builder. I am just the vessel confessing I am the sheep and he is the good shepherd. That's what Ananias is saying here. This disciple, here I am, Lord, whatever you say. And so I would encourage you, when you hear instruction from the Lord, similar to what Ananias is hearing in this hard, difficult, scary situation, when you hear instruction from the Lord that is not quite what you expected or that you're not very comfortable with, I think that probably happens very often, we hear things from the Lord and it's discomforting, right, immediately to our flesh. It's not comfortable often. That first thing that we hear from the Lord, you want me to do what? You want me to take my family here? You want me to, you want me to do, take this step of faith with a job or in this direction with my, with a relationship? And so we get uncomfortable or if it scares you, but you've predetermined in your relationship to Christ as master and savior to do all of his will, then you're in a place to hear the truth of God and be used by him. So you can hear things from God and, and, be dis- and have a level of, uncomfortable, of un- uncomfortability. You can have a level of fear and, 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 and nervousness. But if you've predetermined, so that's really my challenge. Another challenge on top of this whole idea of what is happening with Ananias coming into Saul's life now. Remember, he's going to use him to stand before this ex-murderer, uh, rage-filled Christian killer. And God's saying, go to him. And he says, here I am, Lord. And so he's in this place where God can use him in this life and, and for this miraculous conversion, as, as Eric said. And Ananias' hesitation was because he knew the reputation of Saul of Tarsus. And he even said that. I know this guy. I've heard what he's been doing. And he has power to drag people off to prison. Now, what would you do in that situation if you've been instructed to go and be involved in a person's life that you know that they, just a few hours earlier, they would rather see you dead? And, and, and so he's hesitating, and it's, it's no wonder. And then I'm going to just reference again what Eric had said earlier, verse 15. This is what comforted Ananias in his fear of that instruction. The Lord said to him, he is a chosen vessel of mine. I want you to let those words ring out in your ears a little bit. What would that mean for you to hear God say, he's mine? Even about you, she's mine. He's mine. Right? Think about that's the comfort that Ananias is finding in this instruction. Now God is saying, I've chosen him. He's mine. Isn't isn't conversion by Christ and by the Holy Spirit, isn't it complete? And it does change lives. I'm sure all of you are a testimony 
those of you who are following Christ, that you can give us some kind of testimony of your previous life and say, I'm not who I used to be. There's, there's a huge change because the Spirit now indwells me. He is mine. And in that verse, we see God's will now being told to Ananias to save Saul and transform him. He's telling him he's a chosen vessel of mine. And then he gives him instruction or he tells him about the instruction that he's going to give to Saul. He says, I'm going to send him to be a preacher to the Gentiles and before the children of Israel and before kings, rulers. And that's who Saul is going to be, this apostle that goes with the gospel of Jesus to see other lives transformed. It's no different really with us, right? This, this aspect of this transforming work that God wants to transform us and change us. I don't want it to be any secret that, secret that when God saves a soul through faith in his son, he saves that soul for himself, for his purposes and for his glory. So Saul's story, as Eric has already said, is one that's been written and so has yours already been written. A story that's been written from before time began. Every one of us has been born into this sinful world in a rebellion against God. Every single person born in rebellion against the will of God. Many of us, though, now in this room, and I will not speak for all of you because there are some of you in this this room that I just don't know, and and that's good, but God knows your heart. God knows everything about you. He sees you. Just as he saw Saul in all of his rebellion and and hatred of Christians, and yet he still said, he's mine, I want him, I'm going to change him, I'm going to transform him. I'm going to take his life, I'm going to make it mine, and I'm going to use him, give him a purpose in this life. Many of us have seen grace in God's eyes, and only because of his mercy did we ever come to Jesus to find life. Only because of the mercy of God did we come to him to find life and the forgiveness of sins. It's because God chooses and calls and by his spirit comes after us to bring us to repentance, to faith in his son and reconciliation to God again. That's all stuff that's not necessarily been being written about now here, Saul's conversion, but this is a given. For someone to come to Christ means they've been forgiven of their their sins, reconciled to God, Old slate, I mean, all things passed away. All things passed and new has come. I think that it only takes a minute for you to recall your previous life to then praise God to ho- from whom all blessings flow, right? Like, my life before I knew Christ, thank God it's, a, it's history. Aren't you thankful for that? And maybe you come to this room tonight and you're in that place and you're, maybe you're You're still living in that place of sin and rebellion. Well, God would have you believe in Christ tonight for forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God. Completely forgiven, slate wiped clean, the righteousness of Christ placed upon you through faith in Jesus. Look at Saul as he finds himself before this man, Ananias. We look flashing forward towards the last part of what we had had read, and Saul's now before him. And he hears him say, and maybe you've noticed these words, he said, Brother Saul. Did you notice that when we read it? This is before the scales fell from his eyes. I just want you to notice the work that God is doing. I I do believe that when he was filled with the Spirit and the the scales came off of his eyes, I do believe that was the point of of true conversion right there. He, He sees. I once was blind, but now I see. God gave him sight. But look at what God is doing. Think of the walls that are coming down. Now, Ananias, this man who was afraid, and, and he simply said, here I am, Lord. And now he's standing before this man, Saul, and he says, brother Saul. And the walls that are coming down, the wholeness that is taking place. A man stands before him now that last week or whatever it was, he'd rather have seen dead and, and now he's a brother. That's what the gospel does. The gospel takes those who are enemies and makes them brothers. Isn't that amazing? The, the gospel could take every single person in here with all of our differences and different, uh, uh, cl- you know, I can't, words can't even come to mind. I'm not thinking of the right word. But you guys get it, right? We're all different. 
We come from different places, different tendencies, different sins, different pasts and heritages, different skills. And God can take us all and make us one body through Christ. That's beautiful. That's what the world needs. That's what our community needs. That's what your neighbors need. That's what you need. Sometimes that's just what we need in our family, right? We need reconciliation and we need the gospel to bring peace and bring down walls, right? Like, you know, my, my, my children, they know, I mean, they're, they're, they're brothers and sisters. I want them to act like they're brothers and sisters sometimes, right? The gospel does that with all of us to where I can look at you and through our mutual faith in Christ, a brother, sister, family. That, can you believe that's what's happening here? Think of the miraculous change that's taking place in Saul for those words to come out of Ananias' mouth, Brother Saul. He said, God has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Spirit. You know, I think Saul was blinded to retain the impression of Jesus in his mind until Ananias could pray for him. Well, what would you have thought of if the last thing you saw was a blinding light in Christ and you hear his words, Saul, you're persecuting me. Next thing you know, you can't see anything for three days and you fast. You're trying to figure out what in the world just happened. I've been persecuting God my whole life and I thought I was following him, but I haven't been. And there remains on him this impression of Jesus, the, the voice ringing in his head. He can't see the world. He can't see the distractions of his friends. Remember, he was on the road to Damascus with other people on the way to Damascus to kill, and he can't see them. They drag him by his hand into the city, and he's there in this room for three days. I wish the, the Lord would blind more people today. I really do. That's a genuine wish of mine. Maybe there's times where I should probably wake up some morning blind too because I just need to think about Jesus more and have more of him impressed in my heart and in my mind and not, <clears throat> excuse me, this is, this is heavy. This is serious stuff, guys. We are so in tune to everything else. And we daily don't pay attention to Jesus. I love that he blinded him here. He needed to be blinded. He blinded him and he was blind for three days. You know, I think the devil lies to humanity and says that seeing is believing. I don't think that. I know that. The devil will tell you and every person around you that if you don't see it, if you can't see it, it's not true. Well, Saul learned more in three days of blindness than, than so many people do in a lifetime because there he met Jesus. He met the one who is eternal life, the one who is life eternal, the forgiveness of sins. He met him, and that's what's changing him. So Saul will go on later to say, yeah, I could boast. I could boast in that I was the leader of Pharisees. I knew the law. I was the top dog, but he said, but now my boast is in who? It's in Christ. I choose to boast in Jesus Christ. Saul becomes Paul, the apostle, and through his life will suffer greatly for the cause of Christ. If there's one thing that tells us that there was a total transformation, it's that Saul, when he gave, at that moment when he said, there before Ananias, and the, and the scales fell off of his eyes, and God was going to reveal to him how much he was going to suffer for his name. Look at what Saul was signing up for. He wasn't signing up for your best life now, right? He wasn't signing up for a cushy life of living uh, with comforts. And the Bible's very clear about that, to count the cost. If anybody is wanting to be my disciple, let him first deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. That's a requirement for every disciple of Jesus Christ. If we're not willing to deny ourselves and our own comforts, then there is no, then we are not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now look what Saul signed up for. Look at what he's seen. He, the glory that he had seen in Christ was worth the suffering that he was going to endure for the rest of his life. And if you read through the New Testament and Saul's letters, Paul's letters, they'll become, he's shipwrecked, stoned, beaten, left for dead, suffers famine many times, and he does this, and he still is the man that says, becomes famous words, your grace is sufficient for me. And he boasts in Jesus. He will later say these words in Philippians 1.21, for to me, 
to live is Christ. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a transformation. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Saul's converted there in Damascus and filled with the Holy Spirit. And publicly then, the scripture tells us that he's baptized in that moment. Scales fell from his eyes. He's baptized. And in that moment, he's identifying with the, with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the very next time we see him, if you read on in verse 20, it says that Saul goes on to proclaim what? That Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John 4.15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Saul now is a, is a follower of Jesus Christ. Though days earlier, he was not a follower of Jesus Christ. So what can God do with a heart of surrender, a heart that surrenders to him? You know, and, and, and we have to fully believe, take that whole package, that God is drawing people. If he's drawing you tonight for the very first time, then your response would be to come in faith and say, yes, I believe in Christ. I believe he died for my sins, that he is the only way to eternal life. If you're a believer in this room tonight and you're backslidden and there are sins that are holding you down and there are things that you are not willing to repent of, then you need to, again, freshly look at, am I really following Jesus here? Do I really believe that Jesus died and rose again for my sins and he conquered all sin and death for me? And I wake up every day and I'm under the, the weight of this sin. Guys, Jesus gives power to repent of sin and overcome sin. So maybe tonight you need to repent. There's things you need to turn from, things in this world that you've been holding on to, and you need to simply come and trust Jesus again. So whatever camp you're in, if you're in that camp where you're a believer but you're, you're backslidden or you're not a believer and you need to profess the name of Jesus, that he is the son of God for the first time tonight or you are a believer and you're following Jesus and you're doing the best thing you, you can but still you find daily you're weak, right? We still find that. There isn't a perfect Christian out there. Nobody that has it all together. And so every one of us, what do we conclude? Every one of us tonight, we need the gospel. Doesn't matter where you're at. We all need this very same Jesus that Paul, Saul encountered and that is going to transform his life. And he's now a confessor of Jesus. And he carries his name to the Gentiles. Isn't this a beautiful message? Guys, I would, I would ask you, and we're going to close in prayer, and I'm going to ask you to just think about what you've heard tonight. Both, both ends of this message. God used Eric God's using me. God wants to speak through his word. His word is what is powerful. Think about what he would have you turn from tonight. What are, some, what, are, what are sins that you need to repent of and come running to Jesus again? Because, guys, he's open. His arms are open wide for you to come to him. Is he drawing you tonight? Right? Let's pray. As I pray, would you close your eyes? Pray along with me. I'll have eyes that come back up and He'll start to strum a little bit while we pray, and then, he'll, um, and then he'll close us out in a song. God, it is so good to hear your word tonight and to know that, that you save wretches, that you save men and women who have nothing. Lord, I think about, again, I think about the woman at the well and that, and that she was there and she was empty and broken and that she had tried every single way to fill herself and that you just said, come and drink of me and you'll never thirst again. I thank you for the gospel of Jesus that, that gives us security, that gives us uh, justification and, and reconciliation to the Father. Thank you for... The sovereignty of God we spoke about tonight, that you predestine and you choose before the foundations of the world. And Lord, you are a, an electing God and you are a sovereign God and you can do whatever you want. And we think of all of that and in light of that, here we are, finite people, very broken, and to know that you, you want to save us. We rejoice, Lord, that there are many in this room that are saved. There are many in this room that are forgiven. And Lord, I just want to pray for any in this room that maybe have, has never repented of their sin and come with faith in Jesus, trusting fully in the work of the cross. Lord, that that person, that, that man or woman would tonight do that. Just come believing and confess. 
But Lord, I pray and I, and I, I look forward to the work that you're going to do through our church for this body, God, and the, and the things that you want to do with this message. And I, and I look at how Paul went from there with a very simple message, Jesus is the Son of God. And then he went on from there saying, I determined to know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. And how much does this world need to hear about the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ? Let us not be ashamed of speaking His name. Lord, work in our hearts. If there's repentance needed tonight, Lord, let us do that. And that person, whoever that is, Lord, that they would not leave this room without finding someone to pray with. And Lord, maybe you would remove scales from their eyes tonight if they've been blinded. God, reveal your truth deep in our hearts. Thank you for the the power of your word, for speaking through your servant, Eric. God, we rejoice in that, and we love you for that, Lord. And we thank you for your word tonight. Bless us, Lord, as we sing this last song together. We glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.